What's up guys? It's Dr. LeHue. I'm glad that you are uh, joining me again for another video and today we're going to talk about the healing message for each type on the Enneagram and uh, we're going to start with uh, number one, the uh, perfectionist and we're just going to go around the circle and just briefly summarize each, <coughs> each type, the motivations and uh, uh, what their need is and then um, what each one of those types needs uh, to hear. Uh, or their healing message, what they need to tell themselves, what they need to start believing about themselves. The first one, the uh, reformer, the perfectionist, their passion is anger. And <clears throat> sometimes this looks like frustration with the world around you because the world is not perfect. It is disorganized and a lot of people don't have the value at all for doing the right thing. So this is very frustrating to uh, perfectionists. They are known to be ethical, dedicated, and reliable. I do have my notes in front of me. Um, just so I don't forget anything, they have they're motivated to live in a desire uh, with a desire to live in the right way, to be good people, um, to avoid fault and to avoid blame and to avoid the things that that cause blame. There we get the camera just right. Um, so they have the need to be perfect. Uh, of course, you know nobody can really meet this need. Um, I mean, who's perfect? Who's ever going to be perfect? Um, it's like they were left with the impression as a child that they needed to parent themselves. That to avoid uh, conflict and to avoid pain, they needed to not misbehave. And so they needed to, uh, to, to be right and to do the right things. And so they kind of got that message that you need to be better than, <clears throat> better than you are. You're only good if what you do is, is right. And so if you parent yourself, then your parents don't have to parent you. And so healing begins for perfectionists. Healing begins for type ones when they can begin to say, you know, maybe good enough is good enough. Maybe I'll never get this perfect and that's okay. Maybe I just try my hardest and do my best and then leave it and let it go. And I can go to bed at night knowing I gave my best and I don't have to worry about it that not every meal is going to be you know, perfect. Not every job is going to, I do is going to be perfect. And so when they can learn to say good enough is good enough, that's so hard for, for, uh, the, the type ones to say, but you know, maybe others are right. And maybe, uh, maybe someone else has a better idea than I have. Maybe others will learn for themselves. I don't have to, uh, stop and correct and teach. Maybe others will learn in their own way at their own time. And maybe I've done all that I can do and I'm just gonna have to trust that uh, there are powers at work that are greater than I am and uh, I've done all that that I can do and I can go to bed tonight knowing that I gave my best and when they can learn to say all those things then healing can really begin for them all right the type 2 the helper their passion is pride or their their sin is pride and they are known to be warm, caring, giving people who are motivated by the need to be loved, to love others, to be needed by others, to care for others and be cared for by others. They want to be in the center. They want to be the reason that you are happy. They want um, to take care of you and to be needed and to feel all those feelings. As a child, they they kind of got the message somewhere along the way or the message that resonated with them was that they were only loved if they were helping others and were pleasing to others. If they were caring for others, then they were significant and they had a purpose and they made people's lives better. And that they equated as children that the needs that they have as being selfish and so when you ask, you know, a two, what do they need? They will back up from you. I'm fine. I don't need anything. I'm okay. I don't have any because in their mind they associate their own personal needs as being selfish while looking for your needs. And so it's kind of the shenanigan they play is they think you have needs and that's what gives them the pride is they they don't have any needs. They're here for you. And so it puts them in sort of the 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 high ground, you know, I'm here to take care of you people here. Um, sometimes whether or not these people want to be taken care of or not is beside the point. I'm here to serve you. I don't have needs. I'm fine. 
And so that's the the pride or the shenanigan, you know, you might say of the of the two is they don't see their own needs and they don't value their own needs, which often gets them into trouble because when you're not taking care of yourself, how are you going to take care of others? So they got the message that love is defined as being needed by others and giving to others. You feed others, you give to others, then you know they'll love you, they'll reciprocate that love, and if they need you, then and you put them in that relationship where they need you, then you are loved by them, which isn't always the case. A lot of people will take advantage of twos, um, manipulate them, they're easily manipulated and easily uh, um, taken advantage of because they have such a desire to take care of others. And so they can sometimes get into relationships where, you know, uh, they become enablers, you might say. So the healing message for the two is maybe I could let somebody else do this job. Maybe I'm not needed but still wanted. Um, wow, if you're a two, that probably just really sank in there. That, that probably stings a little bit. That maybe I'm not needed, but still wanted. And if you're a Christian, you get this message is that God doesn't need any of us, but he wants to walk in relationship with us. That's hard for a two to grasp that. Maybe this other person is, is showing me love, even though I'm not perceiving it as love. Twos want to be loved in a certain way. They want to be uh, appreciated and valued, even though they're not going to ask for that. That's what they want. Um, and they want you to respond to them in a certain way. And if you don't, they may feel unloved. They may not feel like they're being loved the right way. And, you know, with each of these types, what we learn is that when they don't feel what they need, they often turn that around. So twos, if they don't feel loved by you, they might they might come across in such a way as to make you feel like you are unlovable yourself. Uh, we'll see that with each of the types. But so the two can really begin to heal when, when he or she says, you know, maybe I could let somebody else do this job. Maybe I'm not needed, but still wanted, and my presence is wanted. Maybe others are showing love for me in their own ways. Like maybe a five is sharing information with me or a seven is wanting to go on an adventure with me. Um, maybe these other people, or a nine is relaxing with me. Maybe they're showing love in their own ways. And maybe I could do something good for myself. And that's not selfish. Maybe I could do something for me. Maybe I could take some time and make my needs known. Okay, so type three, the performer and the achiever. Their passion is deceit because they sometimes start believing their own press. They believe that because I've got all these awards and achievements that, that, that that's what makes me valuable and important. Or they might start to minimize their failures, uh, you know, sort of like doctor their resumes a little bit to make themselves a more desirable candidate for relationships or the job or whatever. They're very success oriented, image, image conscious, wired for productivity. Motivated by a need to be or appear to be uh, successful and to not uh, look like a failure in any way. Um, our country is very three-oriented, as you can, I'm sure, see. The need to succeed. The message that the three received as a child was is that you will be rewarded only for what you do and how well you do it. Um your own feelings as a three may have been discounted and ignored and you were expected to perform and if you performed then you got the applause and you got the attention and you got the admiration and the affection and so well if i if i get the attention and the affection by performing then what if i performed more what if i performed greater or to a greater degree and so in a sense <clears throat> this is really sad but in a sense threes kind of gave up on being loved and settled for being admired uh, like the two kind of settles for being needed and associates that with love the one sort of gives up and associates you know being um, right and being good uh, and being respected being respected as though you're being loved the three says well if I'm admired they kind of confuse that 
and, and, and look at it as though it's, it's the same as being loved. The healing message for the three is, maybe I don't have to be the best. Maybe I don't have to be the winner. Maybe I could just be a competitor. Maybe I could even fail and people would still love me. Maybe people will accept me just the way I am. Maybe I'm valuable even if I don't win, I don't achieve. Maybe others' opinions of me aren't so important. That is a healing message for all of us, but particularly for the achievers. Type four, the romantic individualist. Their passion is envy. You know, they kind of look at the world like everybody else knows who they are and everybody else seems to be relatively well adjusted to life. How come I feel so out of place? How come I don't feel like I fit in? And so they can be kind of envious, maybe not of others' possessions, like greed, but maybe envious just everybody else seems to, to be satisfied with life. Then why am I so unsatisfied with life? Everybody seems to know who they are and what their role is, and they feel disconnected from all of that. It kind of puts them in a position where they feel like an eight, like they're above the rules, the rules don't really apply to me. That's for the vulgarians down there or the eights, the faceless robots. Um, their passion is envy. They are very creative, sensitive, and can sometimes come across as moody. And I think it's just because they're not afraid of melancholy and sadness because they're, they're looking for clues as to who, they're, who they are, their identity. And so they're willing to read all of those inner turmoil or that inner angst because they hope that through understanding that, they'll understand more about themselves and who they are and their identity. They kind of are always singing that song by U2, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know, it's kind of like I, I've done all these things and I am all this, but I'm still sort of like disconnected. I'm still lost um, or feeling, you know, overwhelmed by the weightiness of life. Um, they have oversized feelings. They feel. Uh, these big feelings and then they think about those big feelings and they can get kind of caught in a circle of feeling something and then thinking about what they're feeling okay they have the need to be special different and unique so they want to be set apart they want to be they, they want to know what is it about me that makes me unlike everybody else and so sometimes they can work overtime you know kind of creating a false identity or trying on identities you could say trying on identities like kind of like you put on a mask or put on a costume and they'll try that for a while and then that doesn't really feel right so they'll try a different identity the childhood message that they received was that you are abandoned and alone and cut off from the source of love maybe a parent's love for reasons that you don't understand they felt different than their siblings and different than their parents and as a result they kind of turned inward into their own feelings and imagination in order to cope with the isolation and to get a, a bearing with all that loneliness and so they kind of got the message that you are good or okay if you are authentic if you are true to yourself if you are who you are and you just be who you are. So authenticity is a huge point for fours. The individualist is be real, be yourself, be genuine. Now they may, to those of us who are not fours, we may get a little humored by that because it's kind of a shenanigan in that they are saying be real to themselves while they try on different personalities. You know, today I'm an artist, tomorrow I'm a musician, the next day I'm a you know, and, and, and they may try on all these different, they may wonder about their gender or their gender identity or their sexuality, or they may have a lot of questions about this and kind of move from one personality to the next through life, the whole time saying, be authentic to yourself. And when you ask them, well, who are you yourself? Well, they, they, may, not, they may not have a clear understanding of themselves. So healing can begin for the individualist, for the four, when they say, now, if you're a four, this is going to sting, okay? Uh, maybe there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe I'm okay just the way I am. And this is kind of what they're fighting in life, is they don't, they don't really feel that way. They don't really feel like they're okay just the way they are. Uh, they feel like, you know, they're cut off and separated from everybody, and, and 
something's wrong or different about me and I've got to get to the bottom of that. And when they can say, you know, maybe maybe I do have a personality um, and I'm just not necessarily aware of it. You know, Bob over there, who's a one, he never thinks about his personality, you know, or Sam, who's a five. He never thinks about his personality. In fact, maybe you wish they did think a little bit more about their personality and their hygiene and all that, but most of the other types on the Enneagram are not thinking about who am I and those deep, weighty questions. They're just doing life. They're just waking up and getting things done or running away from their fears. And really, you guys that are in the four zone, you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of alone in that. I mean, I guess all of us kind of go through that at some point in our life, middle school or high school or something, maybe midlife crisis, but fours kind of have that tendency to sort of live there. And if they could, if you as a four could learn to say to yourself, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I am who I am and that's good enough. Maybe I do have a personality, whether I understand it or not. I do come across in a certain way to people and maybe that's, maybe that's good enough. Maybe others do understand me and are supporting me. And maybe I'm not the only one who feels this way, who feels these deep, deep, strong, passionate feelings. All right, type five, the investigator. And their passion is what's called avarice or greed. It may not be greed in the same sense of like greed for money, but it's what's mine is mine and what the information that's mine, primarily information that's mine is mine. They kind of have that Ebenezer Scrooge uh, old curmudgeon kind of uh, attitude about them. They are tend to be analytical and emotionally detached. They can be really good in a crisis because they won't get into all the emotional politics that are going on in people's lives. They just hear the facts and they are able to relate to those facts and say, well, you said this and she said that. And really, here's the bottom line, here's the problem. And they don't get into all necessarily the emotional aspects, the, the heavily charged emotions that everybody else gets into. They're motivated by a need to gain knowledge and a need for uh, information and to conserve their energy. It's kind of like they, they feel like they have a huge brain, but little batteries, okay? So they're gonna conserve their energy um, and detach from the world and detach from relationships while they go off and think their deep intellectual analytical thoughts. The message that uh, they received as a child was that they need to perceive the world around them, is that you're safe if you understand. Knowledge is power. As a child that you either maybe didn't receive the meaningful interaction that you should have received or you got the message that people were going to intrude on you. They were going to come into your life and they were going to invade your space and they were going to take over all of your you know, your shelves in your room and people needed to be kind of pushed back. People, parents and family needed to be pushed back away from. Um, maybe your family was a little overbearing and you felt a little defenseless and so you kind of bunkered down and that's kind of the posture of the five is sort of that bunker posture. As a result, uh, they kind of build a wall around themselves and retreat into a mental world. I didn't say mental ward, <laughs> a mental world. And the message that uh, they, they kind of live by is, I'm good or okay if I've thoroughly mastered something. So it may be the world of uh, you know, electronics or computers or you know, um, ancient history, whatever it is they're in or into, again, it's more important to them that they know what you don't know. And if they teach a class, it's gonna be, let me tell you what you don't know. Everything you thought you knew about American history, and we're gonna, we're gonna challenge all of your assumptions. You know, that's, that's the kind of the posture of the five is, let me show you what you don't know. And so think of them as often like a dump truck. I mean, they just fill up with all this information and they just kind of drive the streets. They don't really want to go to a school. They don't want to go to a classroom. They don't want to sit under a teacher. They just kind of drive the streets, picking up all this knowledge. They tend to be really good at trivial information. They pick up all of this knowledge and it all just goes in this dump truck. You know, and this dump truck's made out of steel and you can't get into it. If you wanted to get into it, it's all protected away from you. And then at times, 
Sometimes uh, when, when, you, when you're not ready for it, they'll back that dump truck up and they'll just download all of that information more than you can handle. It'll just come at you, all kinds of information, whether you're ready for it or not, and you may not even want to hear it all, but it's all dumped out at one time. And that's kind of their way of connecting with you is through information. So the healing message for the five is maybe I can trust people and let them know what's going on in my head and let them into my world and let them know what I need. Maybe I could live happily in this world. Maybe I am safe enough. Maybe I don't need to master everything uh, to be okay in life. Maybe my future will be all right. Maybe I've built a bunker for myself in fear of a zombie apocalypse that's never gonna come. And I'm missing out on life because I'm living underground. And I need to just push myself out of my cave and go walk around and talk to the other villagers. Fives are often kind of like the village hermit, you know, that lives out on the edge, outskirts of town, you know, with their big uh, pointy uh, wizard hat and their cauldron, you know, and, and they're out there learning all of the potions that'll get rid of dragons. Because one day when a dragon comes, I'll be able to cast the spell and the dragon will, you know, will save the village. But what if the dragons never come? What if there is no dragons? You've spent your life, you know, with your scrolls and your potions on the outskirts of town and missed the joy and the laughter of the village. Okay, number six, the loyalist or the loyal skeptic. And their passion is fear. They're the most obvious of the fear types. And they tend to be very committed, very practical, very witty, easy to get along with. That's the whole shenanigan, right? They gotta be easy to get along with because unlike the two who need you to need them, the six is afraid if they're not, you might turn against me. You might turn against me and you might you might have it in for me. So I need to, I need to, we need to keep things tight and we need to be easy to get along with and we need to know all of the rules not like a one who wants to know all the rules and then cast all the rules out for everybody else the six wants to know all the rules so that they don't get in trouble uh, and they don't get fired and so that they'll be okay so they are the worst case scenario thinkers they're preppers they're planners they are organizers in the sense of like uh, thinking through you know, do we have the safety badges? Do we have the flashlights? Do we have the jumper cables? Do we have the... The problem is they may never actually get out and go on the trip because they're so concerned about everything that could go wrong. Um, they need to be sure. They need to be secure. They need to be certain. And they have a hard time coming to those conclusions. They often will ask for your input. And if you don't uh, help them or they don't feel helped by you, they may disassociate from you because, you know, why do I need you in my life? Their thinking is, why do I need you in my life if you're not going to be there to help me? If you're not going to be there to support me? If you're not going to be there in my time of crisis and help me talk through all of these difficult things that could happen and you're not going to help me sort through my problems, then what benefit is there in being in relationship with you? And so they may become very suspicious of you. I kind of get like sixes... You know, they're sitting there at their desk working and they look up and, you know, three of their workmates are coming in from lunch and they're laughing and talking. And the thought that might go through a six's mind is, well, I wonder why they didn't invite me. I wonder what they're laughing about. Maybe they're laughing about me. I wonder if they're, if they know something I don't know. There's that sense of like suspicion always, like, what do they know that I don't know? And uh oh, I wonder if they're forming an alliance over there. And so sixes can kind of end up becoming their own worst enemy because they might start mutinies when there isn't a problem, there isn't a problem. But when they start treating people like those other people might have it in for them, then they can kind of create those self-fulfilling prophecies, you might say. So the message that the six got as a child was, um, you're being raised in an unpredictable situation with no safe place to go. Your protective figure, you know, i.e. your dad, isn't there for you. He may be you know, happy and laughing and playing with you on the floor one day and then tomorrow when he comes home, watch out because you're going to get smacked. And so they they learn 
to sort of pick up on all those subtle clues. When dad comes home, you know, did he, did he pull in quickly and get out and slam the door or did you know he take his time in getting to the front door? When he came in, was he whistling or was he kind of stomping his feet? And so it's like their alerts are on, their satellite you know, is on, their radar is on, there we go, their radar is on, and they're picking up and looking for all those subtle clues. Is this gonna be a good dad night or is this gonna be a bad dad night? And so they're watching, they're, they're clued in on all of those details to sort of gather information to find out, am I in danger or not? Am I safe or not? And ultimately, it's kind of like the person that was supposed to provide that safety for you either failed and they weren't reliable, or I kind of wonder if maybe perhaps also they were so good at it that when they're no longer in your life and you know daddy's gone now or daddy's passed away, you know, well, how am I know I'm gonna be safe now? you know, daddy's not here to protect me anymore. So it may be not just that you had a bad dad or an unpredictable dad. You may have had a very good dad, but maybe he's not in that same place in your life he used to be. And so you, you don't know if you're secure. And so you have a guidance system. Everybody has a guidance system. Sixes kind of wonder if they can trust their own guidance system. They're always kind of trying to reason and sort things out. Is this really okay? Does this person have it in for me? Are they gonna really have my back? And they got them, so they kind of have this story they tell themselves, I'm good or okay if I cover all of the bases and I do what's expected of me. Healing begins for a six um, when you can learn to say, maybe this will all work out fine. Maybe I don't have to foresee every possible problem. Maybe I can, and this is going to be hard for you if you're a six, maybe I can trust myself. Maybe, maybe I can reason this out on my own. Maybe I've spent enough time thinking about it and I need to just take action. Maybe, you know, most of the things in life that, that we worry about never come about. We just, we spend all of our time worrying about stuff that never is gonna happen. Sixes are, they have an award in worry, okay? And they'll say, well, I can't help it, it's just how I am. Realize this, sixes. The other types on the Enneagram are not primarily sitting around worrying about what could go wrong. When you realize that, you know, the sevens, for example, are right next to you, they're not worried about all this stuff and they seem to be making it in life. There are things in life that you should worry about or be concerned about, but most of the time the problems we get into are, they're not destroying problems. They're just they can make our life a little bit more challenging, a little more difficult, but we'll get through it. And we've got supportive people around us that that will help us get through those things. And when you're backed into a corner, you know that you can come out swinging. You know you're gonna get it done. So maybe you can just relax a little bit and say, maybe I don't have to worry about everything. Maybe I can, maybe I can just relax, okay? The seven, the enthusiast, the adventurer, their sin is gluttony, their passion is gluttony because they believe that there's something out there that I need in order to be filled or fulfilled in life. And so they tend to be very fun and spontaneous and adventurous because they're jumping from one thing to the next looking for what's going to meet their need. So like the four feels like they're missing something. Everybody else has something they don't have. The seven feels like they're missing out on something. And so they want to run away from pain, run away from you know the difficult things in life, the hard things in life, and are forever you know sort of the Peter Pan. Uh, look for that next star, you know, uh, the land of Neverland, where you know we remain children forever. And I get this. I'm a seven. Okay, so I'm a counter seven, but I'm I'm a seven. The message you received as a child is you're on your own. Now, not you're on your own, you have to meet all your needs, but you're on your own, you're, you're on your own, you need to occupy yourself. And so that's what sevens do the rest of their life. They spend trying to occupy themselves. And if you can occupy yourself with dice and jacks, okay, but what if you could occupy yourself with firecrackers? Firecrackers is more exciting than, okay, you get the, the idea? So they're... They, they kind of believed that they were deprived of nurturing or it was removed from them too soon. And so you handled the fear uh, by searching for distractions to minimize or repress fears and avoid pain. 
you decided to focus on positive things and the fun things around you and rely on yourself for nurturing yourself. Kind of the message they have that they're operating from is you're good or you're okay if you feel good and you get what you want. Well, you can see the inherent danger in that. Some of the things we want are not good for us. Healing begins for sevens when they can say to themselves, maybe what I already have is enough. Now, to you other types on the Enneagram, that's probably common sense. And I have to admit to myself, that's common sense. But yet, hearing that and understanding it in sort of a cerebral way is not the same as really applying it to your life. And as a seven, it can be really challenging to really just grasp that truth. Maybe I don't need anything else. Maybe what I have is enough. Maybe I don't need some other experience. Maybe what I'm doing right now is fine. Now, when you get a seven in a doctor's office waiting room, you know, they're losing their mind because they're thinking to themselves, we could be doing anything else, literally anything else would be more fun than this. But healing begins when you can say, you know, I don't really need to be anywhere else. I don't really need to be doing anything else. What I'm doing right now is fine. Maybe I could just embrace this boredom and not try to run away from it and just accept it. And maybe even I could think important thoughts like fours do like fives do. Maybe I could think important thoughts during this this time when there's quote unquote nothing else to do. Maybe what I already have is enough. Maybe there's nowhere else I need to be right now. Maybe I'm not missing out on anything. If you're a seven, that just resonated with you. I know it did. All right. So number eight, the challenger, their passion is lust or intensity. They have a commanding, intense, and confrontational nature about them. They're motivated by a, the need now this is gonna be, this may be the most powerful thing you've ever heard as an eight, okay, if you're listening. And those of you who live with eights, husbands, wives, children, parents, if you live with an eight, listen to this because this will make so much sense to you if you haven't heard it already. Eights have the need to be against, period. The need to be against. You say against what? Doesn't matter. Put a, put a subject, put a topic, put an idea, put something on their calendar and say, hey, on Thursday, I scheduled you for an appointment with so-and-so. You will see immediately they have a need to be against. Why did you schedule me for that? What gives you the right? What makes you think I want to do that? You can go to that appointment if you want to, but not me. So they have this need to be in opposition or objectionable. They're motivated by a need to be strong and the need to avoid feeling any kind of weakness or vulnerability. They don't want to feel that. So they have this need to be against. And that'll make so much sense. If you're raising kids that are eights, just realize that whatever you tell them to do, like a one wants to comply. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. You never have to tell me again because I'm going to tell myself to do it. You tell an eight what to do and they kind of raise themselves up like, who are you to tell me what? I should be doing. Who are you to tell me what I have to eat on my plate? This is my plate. Why did you think you could put vegetables on my plate? Okay. So they kind of got the message that you are good or you are okay as long as you are strong and in control of the situation. And every eight watching this video right now just said, of course. <laughs> But the rest of us on the Enneagram know you're, not, you're never really in as much control as you think you are. You'd like to think you're in control, but there's a lot of factors in life that are, that are beyond your control. And we just recognize that's the way life is. Eights want to control their environment. They want to determine what's in their yard, what's not in their yard. And if you put something in my yard that doesn't belong in my yard, then I'm going to get in your face and tell you to take it out. Okay? Healing begins for eights when they can say... Now listen, maybe this person isn't out to take advantage of me. Maybe they're not trying to sign me into some contract, you know, and, and ruin my life. Maybe they're not trying to ruin me. Maybe this other person really has my best interests at heart. Maybe I should listen to them. Maybe they really do care about me. Maybe I could be myself and be vulnerable with them. Maybe I could let them know what's in my heart. Maybe they're not trying to take advantage of me. Maybe I can let down my guard a little more. Maybe I could let my heart be touched more deeply. That's hard for an eight. 
Okay, the last one, number nine. The peacemaker. Their sin or their passion is sloth. And it always doesn't always mean laziness. It means they're not maybe necessarily awake to what they want in life. They're kind of asleep to their own ideas and dreams. They found out, okay, they found out that it's a lot easier to get along with people if you just disappear. Now that is so sad. If I just disappear to what I want and I just disappear to what I think, then I can get along with everybody. And that's their whole shenanigan. Everybody loves them because they get along with you. Because they die to themselves, literally. They die to themselves, their hopes, dreams, and aspirations in order to realize yours. And that's why we love them. We applaud them for the very thing that's a problem. They are pleasant, laid back, and accommodating. They're motivated by a need to keep the peace and merge with others and avoid conflict. Merge with others. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to the nine, but whatever you value is what they're going to value. They tend to like pick up you know, sort of the energy of the friends around them. They need to avoid conflict. The message that they received as a child was, your desires don't matter. Now let that sink in. If you're not a nine, let that sink in. The, the person you love that's a nine. The message that they kind of got as a child was, you know, like Harry Potter, who's a nine, just get back under the stairwell and we'll feed you when we want to feed you. And they kind of have that mentality about them, that nature about them, that, well, what I want really doesn't matter. Um, these children may have felt overlooked or neglected or unimportant. Um, they may have felt lost. They may have felt ignored or attacked for having needs and expressing yourself or your opinion. So they just decided to just go beneath the radar and keep a low profile and everything will be all right. They kind of operate from the message that you are good or okay if everybody around you is good or okay. Talk about a lot of pressure to be under, really. And that pressure is exhausting. No wonder they're sin is sloth. If you have to keep everybody around you okay, um, I think Raymond on Everybody Love Ray Everybody Loves Raymond is a nine, and he's constantly in this situation between the strong feelings of his wife and the strong feelings of his parents, and he's just trying to keep peace with everybody so that his life can be unaffected. He just wants to watch TV and play golf. The nine uh, feels that that everybody needs to be okay. Healing begins when a nine can say. Maybe I can make a difference. Maybe my life counts. Maybe I'm important. Maybe I'm here for a reason. Maybe if I woke up, um, I could accomplish something in life. Maybe if I let my vision and my dreams and my needs be known and I cared about what I care about, maybe I could be more powerful than I realize. And man, it's an awesome thing when nines wake up. Walt Disney was a nine. When they wake up to their dreams, when they wake up to what they want in life, well, they moved to a three, an achiever. Um, so this has been a helpful journey and going around each type and just kind of saying, you know, what's the energy of each type and what's the message they received as a child and what's their healing message? And I hope that if you uh, watch this video, I hope that you resonated with uh, the truth and I hope that you begin your healing journey. If you haven't already, you begin your healing journey and learning to accept the truth disconnect yourself away from your personality don't let your personality be in charge of you and um, as always uh, what this will help is it'll help you be more present to life you'll no longer have to be you know ignore your needs like a nine or chase after tomorrow like a seven or you know hide in your bunker as a five you can be more present with the people around you, more compassionate for yourself, more compassionate with the people that you love, and really just learn better to be you. You. You are who God created. And you are who the people in your family love. But most of us, we have a hard time just understanding ourselves. And so, I'm glad you're on this journey with me. I hope that this video has been helpful to you. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. You can look in the description if you want more information. And I hope uh, it's been a blessing to you and be present to life, guys. Till next time.